Grace and peace. Welcome to worship at Eastminster Presbyterian Church. We're so glad that you could join us for worship uh, today, both here in the sanctuary as well as online. A couple things to mention. If you could please take a moment to pass the pew pad located along the center aisle, taking note of who is worshiping beside you so you can greet them by name couple things to highlight from uh, the bulletin. There's still a few bells in the back if you'd like to participate in the Christmas bell program. Um, remember, you can take a bell and then sign up in the book in the back and help provide Christmas for a family in need. Uh, December 18th, you're going to want to make sure you're here for one of the services. At both 9 and 11, we'll be having our wonderful Christmas cantata. It uh, promises to be a, a wonderful uh, time of worship and service, and we're just so grateful for the choir being able to uh, lead us in worship that day. And then uh, Christmas Eve, you'll want to consider which service you want to join us for. We're going to have three services on Christmas Eve, 5, 7, and 9. The 5 o'clock service, it's about a half an hour. It is a family service. It's interactive. There's call and response during uh, the gospel story as we reflect on the life of baby Jesus. It's geared towards families. Uh, so if you have little ones in your life, that's a great service to bring them to. We'll still be doing the traditional uh, moment of uh, raising the candles uh, and singing some Christmas carols as well with that. And then 7 o'clock is a traditional service, and then 9 o'clock is traditional with the choir and communion. So you want to consider how, how you want to join us that day. And then Christmas Day, we will be having one service at 11 a.m., uh, so consider how you would, uh, if you're able to join us for that. Let us come together as the body of Christ, and let us worship God in peace. Please join in the responsive call to worship. God's vision of peace is a realm where all live together in harmony. Enemies become friends. Fear gives way to understanding. God calls us to be this community. Let us gather together in worship. A voice cries out in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. A choir sings in the silence, come, Emmanuel. Every valley shall be filled, every heart shall be made whole. For peace is stronger than turmoil, and love is louder than hate. As we light our second Advent candle, we pray for the holy peace of God. Come now, O child of Mary. Come now, O Prince of Peace.
John the Baptist's cry echoes through the ages. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. Here and now we go to God in humility and faith, confessing our sins together. God of all creation, your vision of peace is beyond our knowing. We have been hurt and we have seen destruction. So we turn around and hurt others, destroying what you call good. Forgive us and fill us with your knowledge so that we may help bring forth your peaceable kingdom. Christ comes into our world. Christ comes into our lives to purify us and give us another chance. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. We rejoice in the hope Christ offers us. Thanks be to God. Peace of Christ be with you. Please turn and share that peace in ways you feel comfortable. Reading from Isaiah chapter 11. A shoot shall come out from the stump of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. The spirit of the Lord will rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. His delight shall be in the fear of the Lord. He shall not judge by what his eyes see or decide by what his ears hear. But with righteousness he shall judge the poor and decide with equity for the oppressed of the earth. He shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth and with the breath of his lips he shall kill the wicked. Righteousness shall be the belt around his waist and faithfulness the belt around his loins. The wolf shall live with the lamb. The leopard shall lie down with the kid. The calf and the lion will feed together. And a little child shall lead them. The cow and the bear shall graze. Their young shall lie down together. And a lion shall eat straw like an ox. The nursing child shall play over the hole of an asp. And the weaned child shall put its hand on the, hand on the adder's den. They will not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain. For the earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. On that day, the root of Jesse 
shall stand as a signal to the peoples. The nations shall inquire of him, and his dwelling shall be glorious. Reading from Matthew chapter 3. In those days, John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness of Judea, proclaiming, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. This is the one of whom the prophet Isaiah spoke when he said, The voice of one crying out in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. Now John wore clothing of camel's hair and a leather belt around his waist. His food was locusts and wild honey. Then Jerusalem and all Judea and all the region around the Jordan were going out to see him. They were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and the Sadducees coming for his baptism, he said to them, you brood of vipers who warned you to flee from the coming wrath. Therefore, bear fruit worthy of repentance. And do not presume to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our ancestor. For I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children to Abraham. Even now the axe is lying at the root of the trees. Therefore, every tree that does not bear good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. I baptize you with water for repentance. But the one who is coming after me is more powerful than I and I am not worthy to carry his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hands. He will clear his threshing floor and will gather his wheat into the granary. But the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. The word of the Lord. Be Let us pray. Savior God, guide us by your word and your spirit that we might hear your truth, your truth read, your truth proclaimed, your truth sung, that we would prepare our hearts for Christ's birth. We ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Much has been floating around the media lately about apologies. Some might say repentance, but really about apologies. If you recall from last year at last year's Oscar Awards, the actor Will Smith slapped Chris Rock after Chris Rock made a joke about his wife. If you saw it or saw it on the internet afterwards, it was quite a shocking moment. As a result, Will Smith has been banned from attending the Oscars for 10 years, and he's resigned his voting position with the Academy. He's apologized to Chris Rock for, as he said, losing it. But recently, he has been making the rounds on the TV circuit in preparation for a film that was released this week. Many have asked, as they've reflected on this situation, has Will Smith apologized enough? It is an example, just one example, of bad behavior among the celebrity class, class asking to rebuild their status with an apology. It's an interesting question to consider. Is an apology ever enough if it doesn't mean somebody's behavior has changed? With Will Smith, we don't know the answer to that, but it will be interesting to see. As we turn to the lectionary, one of the first things you might notice is how Matthew handles John the Baptist. It's a little different than the other Gospels. In the other Gospels, there's a slow burn towards John the Baptist. We kind of build up to John the Baptist. You see a preview of him. But in Matthew's Gospel, he's made a theological choice here. John the Baptist is abrupt in his appearance. The text literally says, he appears. 
It's as if John bursts on the scene, breaks down the door, crashes in. His sudden appearance is to get our attention. The authors of Matthew are trying to tell us something in this moment, something about John the Baptist, that they want us to be surprised by him. The author of one commentator said that the action of God in history is often so sudden that it is unexpected, that it can be even intrusive, that the will of God cannot be equated with group progress, human growth, or social development arising naturally out of human possibilities. God's will does not always work gently climbing quietly the ivy up the lattice of history. Sometimes there are moments where Elijah appears, where a nation repents, where a Berlin Wall is dismantled, where a Martin Luther King strides across the landscape. Moments when God shatters the mold violates the categories, breaks into the world as though it was a jarring surprise. And that is what he's doing in the Gospel of Matthew. We are meant to be jarred awake. John's appearance is a surprise to his community, to his neighbors, to those around him. He's attracting a prophetic, uh, a following with his prophetic attire. The crowd that is gathered there that day and on any day, I'm sure, is there for mixed reasons. Some to see the spectacle of this wild-looking prophet. Some are there out of habit. Some because they have to be. And probably some out of devotion. The description of his dress and his diet tells us a few things about John. It invokes his simplicity, that he's trying to simply live in this moment, to simply live. But it also tells us something else. His dress and his diet is also a protest in some senses. That he's protesting the excesses of the religious leaders and the city dwellers around him. His message is simple. Prepare the way of the Lord. Make your path straight. Get your house in order. John's prophetic message is unique. If you review Hebrew scriptures... The message of prophets is often different. When a prophet delivers a message, the first thing they do is they offer a list of the king's sins or the people's sins. It's a list that can often go on for pages. They've worshipped other gods. They've married the wrong people. They've neglected the poor, the outcast, the foreigner. There is a litany of sins that are listed, and the prophet is telling them, you have done this wrong. But John's call is different. It's broad. It's nonspecific. The only specific sin he cites is that of the religious leaders not so gently reminding them that you can't trust status and connections or affiliations. We need to trust in God. John's call reminds us that we ought to be careful pointing out or even knowing our neighbor's sins. That we should consider our own lives our own lives with the guidance of the Holy Spirit, asking us what the Holy Spirit is speaking to us. John is asking us if our path is bent or crooked, asking us where we are on our own spiritual journey. Why have we gathered this day? Is it out of habit? out of devotion? What are the things in our own life that we are dealing with that needs to be named? 
that needs to be challenged, nurtured, admitted to. John's call to repentance isn't about some sort of moral failure. It's a broad calling, a calling to address sinful thinking, asking us to follow the Holy Spirit's leading, to consider the ways we're thinking of our own selves, others, and God. An internal conversation that adjusts the way we live in the real world, that changes the people that we are, calling us to something new. And this is not an easy work. Internal work is quite difficult. I recently came across a story highlighting how difficult and complex this can be. It was a conversation that a community was having. But how do we be truthful about who we are? In truth, we've all been doing a lot of this lately. But this was a community's own wrestling. Old North Church in Boston has stood as a beacon of freedom for generations. It's a church with an absolutely amazing history, right? We probably all learned some version of a poem with Old North Church in it. One of the interesting things about the history of Old North, though, is that it actually functioned as a normal congregation for most of its history. It was just like a church like this. It just happened some spectacular events occurred there. They actually, in 1806, if you've ever been to Old North Church, you'll probably remember those beautiful pew boxes that are there where the wealthy would pay the church uh, a rent to have those pew boxes and sit in those pew boxes. Those were actually removed in, from the church in 1806. They pulled them all out and they put in pews just like you would see in a normal congregation today. They were experiencing somewhat of a revival at that point in their history. And the pew boxes were actually put in storage. It sounds like almost like a shed or a barn. And as attendance and the neighborhood changed in Old North, they began needing to find new sources of revenue for themselves. And actually in 1912, <laughs> they reinstalled the pew boxes that you see today. According to the legend, their legend, they actually matched the nail holes in the pew, bo in the pew boxes to the nail holes on the floor. You can believe that one if you want, but they did. <laughs> the congregation actually still remains. You can go and worship at Old North Church. You need to uh, make a reservation online, but you can attend Old North Church. But what's fascinating about this is how the church has changed. There's more than a half million people who visit that church every year to see the historical site. The nature of their mission and ministry has changed. Because they've become a historic site, they've really reflected on their own history. One of the things they discovered was that Paul Revere, as a boy, actually rang the steeple bell at Old North, that he pulled the ropes <laughs> at one point in his life. It's part of the reason he knew that, you know, if he put lanterns in the tower, people would see it from everywhere. I also always find it ironic. This, this is an Episcopal church. So this is the king's church. And it's the place that the rebellion starts, if you will. The two lanterns shining out the start of the revolution. But studying the history for the congregation at Old North has also led to some uncomfortable moments as the current rector, the pastor, Matthew Cadwell of Old North says, 
One of the things that we discovered after reflecting on our, upon our history is that slavery touched every area of Boston, including the church. It has been an important and difficult learning for us at Old North. Like when the congregation discovered that the steeple Paul Revere used that signaled freedom to the world was built with lumber harvested by enslaved people in South America. That the funds donated to raise that steeple were mostly earned through the slave trade. Or when the congregation, if you've ever visited there, there's a, there's a gift shop in the church. When the congregation realized that their gift shop uh, was named after a slave trader and a man who ran a smuggling ring out of Old North Church. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The historian Jared Ross Hard Hardsty uncovered the scheme in a book called Mutiny on the Rising Sun. The captain actually met a bad end and there was another church member present when he died. So, you'll have to read the book for more. <laughs> but what, what Captain Newark Jackson was doing is he was traveling to South America with a boat filled with humans, with people. He'd go to South America and he would trade those people for cacao, what we make chocolate out of. The cacao was actually illegal because he didn't play, pay any taxes on it. It wasn't registered. So he would trade his people for cacao. He would take the cacao and then he would go to the island of Barbados, sail up to Barbados, where the cacao would quite literally be laundered. It would be mixed with legal cacao that was grown legally that had taxes paid on it. And then he would take it all back to Boston. And then the cacao would be processed in one of Jackson's shops. The process was done by paid and enslaved laborers. At that point in time in the, in the history of our country, chocolate was all the rage. The cacao would be mixed with spices, they would be then sold into little squares, almost like baker's chocolate. And you would take that piece of chocolate that was mixed with spices and put it in hot, hot water. It was all over Boston. It was one of the biggest businesses. These discoveries, though, caused Old North to reconsider how they see themselves. Yes, they're still a beacon of freedom. But now, when they tell their history, they present a story that's more reflective of the actual history. The visitors now, this is within the last four years, when they come, they don't just get to see the church boxes of the wealthy, but they're also able to see the cold gallery where the poor and enslaved stood or sat. Their reflections have led to a more honest but complicated story. John's voice. John's voice is calling out to all of us. Prepare the way of the Lord. Make your path straight. During this Advent season, how will the Holy Spirit call you to reflect on your own inner life? To consider how you think about yourselves, yourself, others, and God. Let us pray. God, we thank you that repentance is a process. And that God, like the stars, you are ever present with us, calling us, 
loving us. God bless us this day. In Christ's name, amen. Please remain standing as we affirm our faith together by reciting the Apostles' Creed printed in our bulletin. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. God gives out of God's abundance. Let us respond to God's generosity with our gifts and our lives.
God of mercy, accept these gifts. Multiply them for Christ's mission of love and grace all over your world. In Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated. All of heaven and earth belong to God. God who is coming in glory to reveal a new creation. Let us offer our lives to the Lord. The Lord be with you. you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Blessed are you, O Lord our God. The earth is full of your knowledge and your glory. You made all creatures to live in peace and safety and sent a little child to lead us. Therefore, we praise you, joining the song of the universal church and the heavenly choir. Blessed is Jesus Christ, our Savior baptized by John. Christ came to deliver us from sin, to pour out the Holy Spirit upon your church. By our faith in Christ, we have the hope of eternal life. Remembering your goodness and grace, we offer ourselves to you with gratitude. As we share this joyful feast, Christ has died, Christ has risen. Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit upon us and upon this bread and cup. Make us one in body and blood of Christ Jesus, our Lord. Fill us with wisdom and understanding, knowledge and power. Grant that we may live in harmony with one another as we await the coming of the kingdom of heaven. And God, this day we lift up to you many concerns that you have laid on our hearts. Those concerns that are both spoken and unspoken. And God, this day we lift up Miranda and Journey and Bob and Dolores and Richard and John and Jody and Barbara and Jim and Kathy and Harold and Greg. And God, we also pray for those who are grieving the loss of Ron. Comfort them in these difficult moments. May they sense the Holy Spirit near to them, O God. We pray all of this through Jesus Christ. In the unity of the Spirit, we bless you, God of glory, now and forever. And in that spirit of unity, we pray the prayer you taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We give thanks that on the night of his arrest, Jesus took bread And after giving thanks to God, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, this is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant sealed in my blood. I wondered when that would happen. Sealed in my blood for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink of it, do this in remembrance of me. Remembering your goodness and grace, 
We offer ourselves to you with gratitude as we share in the, this joyful feast, the gifts of God for the people of God. In just a moment, the servers will come forward and they'll come out and serve everyone in their pews. And then we will take a communion together. body of Christ, take and eat.
blood of Christ. Take and drink. Let us pray. God, our hope, we give you thanks that you have given us a foretaste, a foretaste of justice, of righteousness, of peace, of your new promised creation. Strengthen us with this heavenly food as we seek to serve your holy realm. Lead us to live in joyful expectation of the coming again in glory of Jesus Christ, our Savior and our Lord. In Christ's name, amen. Prepare the way of the Lord with your repentance, with your forgiveness of others, with your ministries of compassion and grace. And may God's grace, Christ's peace, and the Spirit's guidance be with you today and always. Amen. Amen.